Okay, so I think we are live, uh, Janki. Yeah, I'll just confirm it. Yeah, he sent a message. I'm not announcing. Okay. Uh, okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar uh, brought to you by the Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation India through Ortho TV and Omnicurus. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Raj Gopalan from uh, Pondicherry. Raj Gopalan is an old friend of mine. We were to, uh, he was in Jipma Pondicherry when I did my MBBS there many years ago. And since then has shuttled between Bangalore and Pondicherry and is back in Pondicherry. But one thing has been steady is that he's always been interested in teaching and especially in postgraduate education. And uh, it's uh, a great pleasure and a privilege to have him with us today. Over to you, Raj Gopal. Thank you, Dr. John. Thank you for the kind words. Good evening to all. Now, before I start, a couple of uh, thoughts sharing with the postgraduates and others who are listening. Uh, see, what my plan is to share with you regarding two cases of spine, which I felt can be kept as short case. And unfortunately, sp uh, the spine, if it was probably a knee problem or a shoulder problem, it is easier to demonstrate many things. But spine it is difficult, and that too particularly one of the deform one of the things I have taken is to more you may not be able to see so much on inspection. Examination if you do will be easier. So I have the, I have presented the way as from the examination viewpoint of how I will ask you or what I will ask you or what I expect. This can vary from examiner to exam examiner and place to place. So. Uh, all I can say is, at least from one end of India to other end of India, I've been examiners for almost quite a few institutions. So on average, I think this will go. Now, the first case, what I'm having is a spinal deformity. If, if we suppose we had a patient with us and you are examining, it'd be totally different. But I am trying to stick as much as possible to that. So let's assume that you have this patient with you and the patient who had given this history. You're asking her, how old is she? She says, I'm 17 years old. What's your problem? He says, I have a deformity of the back. When did you know it? Three years back. So I am giving you this information. At this stage, I'm stopping you. What I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you what is will be my plan of conducting the examination. And your plan is to answer. Now, First thing I'll ask you is, what more do you want to ask in the history? The thing is, if you ask something, I will give the answer. I am substituting for the patient. If you do not ask, I will not tell you. So you will not know that when you make a diagnosis, you may be handicapped by not asking something. After that, I'll put up a picture of the patient, ask you what, what can you see in inspection? Inspection you can see much more clearly in a photograph than real. If you want additional photograph, you have to ask the exam, then only I show. If it is not there, I'll say it is not there. So you have to tell me, sir, I will see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on inspection. It's a short case, so you don't have to go everything, only relevant. Then you will not go to everything. I may ask you anything special you want to do, special test, whatever you say, I will give you the findings. Inspection I won't give you, but Palpation, movements, deformity, special test, I will give you because you can't test. With those findings and what you asked, I said, what is your diagnosis? So if you have not told me one test, neurology, you don't have it. So what's your diagnosis? If you say, I don't know diagnosis, okay, what are the possibilities? And why do you say that? Then, okay, your diagnosis is this, how do you proceed? You will ask for, say, X-ray, MRI, whatever you ask, I give you the picture that you have to see. It. Then I may ask you the diagnosis from the imaging and how you manage. This is how we will go. So we start. So we start the same thing. You have a 17 year old girl with a deformity in the back. Notice three years back. So what are the points that I would expect you? So many other things are there. Naturally, you can't be telling everything is a patient like this. If the patient is there, you can ask, but here it is not there. 
So, few basic points. I told you a girl, 17, she was a young girl, three years back. So, she was adolescent. So, you want to know whether it was from birth, what is the age of onset? She told you three years, but she may be wrong. There may be something else that you can ask her. About the unnatural history, anything important? During the delivery, anything important? During the birth and during post postnatal period? And you saw the deformity for three years, is it progressive? One of the points in the history which you should not miss is it has anything to do with her adolescent period. As she attained minarchy, after that has the deformity increased. You ask for associate congenital anomalies. Very, very important. All that will come later. Ask about the family history, it's very important. It may be a totally painless condition. Or minimal pain, she didn't tell you. You will have to ask her. I put Vinaki again because that is what in a female patient with this deformity, that is very, very important. Now let's go. Why do we ask? See, one important thing is when I ask you, what do you ask? You say, I ask for age, I ask for uh, milestones. The first question I ask you will be, why do you ask? If you don't know why you are asking. Tomorrow you ask the patient and patient today can ask you why. And if you don't know why you are asking, he won't be happy with you. So you should know what is the relevance. But the important thing is, if you have a child or adolescent person coming with you, if there is a problem with any of these questions, right from milestones to anatal, family history, everything, it may indicate either a neuromuscular or congenital. That is the reason for asking these questions. There are many other questions that are important. For example, if why do we ask about a congenital anomaly? If you have a congenital anomaly, the patient has a congenital anomaly, you have a higher chance of having other congenital problems like scoliosis. So, and also the milestones. For example, there are so many um, neurological problems where the milestones also will be delayed. Family history is very important because many spinal deformities are prevalent within families. And there are also there are diseases which affect the musculoskeletal system and the family history. And more important, a positive family history gives a greater risk of progression. Like you see, this girl was a completely a small girl. She came to George, I think, in about 19 or 20 years back. And when she came, Michelle, she had come with such a severe deformity. And there was other siblings in the family with the same, the same girl. And Important thing about the age. What is the importance of age? The age in which the spinal deformity was noticed. One I told you, if it is from very early age or if it is from birth they had a problem, then you know it's a congenital one. But even others, you can have the progression. In the patient, the problem is worse prognosis as well as the treatment and progression is concerned. This is a very important thing. The patient may not talk about pain because pain may not be that significant or it may be totally painless. Usually, most of this kind of deformities, which are due to mechanical problems, they are painless. But they can be painful. So you can't think that because patient has got a deformity, it may not be painful all the time. No. It may be secondary to a pre-existing problem. The deformity may be only a manifestation of a spinal tumor or a herniated disc, all that can be painful. Sometimes even a pure mechanical deformity can be causing very low grade pain. But if patient is having, you have a deformity and patient is having radiating pain to the limbs, night pain, systemic complaints like bowel bladder problem, you must think that this is probably not a mechanical problem. There is something else. So your history and examination has to be kept. So these are not from the exam point of view alone. This is important from your particular point of view too also. So in the history, nobody is going to fail you because you did not tell one or two points. But it is important to, for your diagnosis because since you didn't ask, I won't tell you that. More important is your clinical examination, which is where we can't give you the patient if it is going to be a, a virtual examin examination or an online examination. So what we will do, I will put up a patient like this without showing the head, without showing the complete this thing. So I'm giving you a limited wish. 
reason i wanted to concentrate only here and i'm going to ask you all right the patient now you will say sir i want to see the friend no i have only this tell me what you can see in this and there when you look again you in a short case you don't have time to look at everything or tell everything you should know what see you have seen that you see there is a deformity you should know what are the important points i'll be happy if somebody is going to say sir i will do this 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 i may have 10 points in my mind even if you are saying five it is pretty good so you should be prepared you should again there's a picture in front of you of a die uh, image in front of you with that you should be telling from the top to bottom if you could see the head from the head right to the bottom we'll come to that little later but don't forget you will be in the exam particularly you will be looking only at the spine some striking things in this particular girl it may be easier but if you have a patient like this your first thing should not be the deformity look at the general examination a inspection of generally and the inspection of the back so what are the important things that you will see you will look for in the patient you have or which see i can change any picture and put if one candidate i have put this other candidate i'll put a normal spine ask him what will you look for so few things are very important you have already heard of you studied so many times particularly in the club food you examine for a spina bifida occulta so what are the telltale signs a dimple hairy patch swelling or pigmentation all suggest spinal anomaly which could be any kind of spinal dysplasia cofele spots skin tags or rash axillary freckles can suggest neuropathy so these are the things you are going to see particularly this um, lady when she came to us all are from johns she was almost 20 to 24 years old something in that age group and you can see a tuft of hair there and she came it obviously a uh, probably a congenital one but the deformity became later only so so much progressed even then they did not come till this stage now once you have looked at general examination then look at the curve so you are saying that this patient has a curve now this particular patient or i'll put the next patient it will be not so easy to make out some of the cafele spots where the dark skin so you are going to look for you are going to for general examination look for for any curve or deviation this remember in the scoliosis which comes a gross deformity any of us can make out like that girl there but in the early stage all you will see will be asymmetrical prominence of one side if it is thoracic or lumbar depending on where the deformity is there will be asymmetrical prominence which can be easily missed unless you undergo the patient and particularly in the female that that is why they come late so that is the early sign not a prominent scapula or a head not being in the center these are not the common ones so this let's see now now this is the same girl which i put earlier now you see the difference now this particular this from the book you can see that this patient the uh, prominence of the scapula and there is a uh, the uh, the head is not exactly centered that you may miss but you should not miss that the scapula is problem that may be the earlier sign this patient which we say here here also you can say that you can see the shoulder is on the same level you can see that the scapula also not at the same level what scapula is more prominent you are clearly seeing a spinal curvature this much you can see but you cannot see by the head is centered or not because neither are you seeing the gluteal cleft which is for them taken as the midline nor are you seeing the head now we go to a patient it's normally this patient is different you can see this patient uh, with the color with the darker skin it is more difficult to get the lay spots but you can very clearly see even without seeing the gluteal with gluteal cleft which is cut off you can see that the head is not centered so shoulder is not the same level other thing you can see very clearly is that look at the arm elbow but the flank the distance is increased this is a very very important thing so let's see what are the things you must see a diagrammatic one where you can see one just just move this up for me to see here 
Okay. So sorry, I'm going to go back. Ah, so first thing will be the shoulder. Here you can see this is a diagrammatic one. So we can uh, look at diagram and do the picture. So you can see the eight centimeter shoulder height. And before that, you could have probably told about the duration of head. I have put it number five. If you go top to order, that will come. I am putting what is very obvious. That is why in this one the order is changed. Because when if I if you if I ask you, it better to go one two three four five six. But you are seeing what is more obvious and strike your right. That's why I said what is very striking here for me the shoulder is totally asymmetrical. Scapula is prominent. I even marked it out, and you see the distance between the arm and the flank increased. Uh, you probably can't make out very clearly. There is an unequal waistline and the hip is at a high, higher level. Now you see the head, there's a definite deviation. Pelvic is oblique, you can't see the limb length inequality. So that's something you probably need a, a real patient in front of you or lying down position. So at least a few things, the asymmetry of the shoulder, scapula, Levels, scapular prominence, scapular size, the distance from the arms to the flank, and pelvic tilt, head deviation. That these are pelvic mobility and head deviation these are the important points that you must have inspection. This you can see. If you don't tell, the examiner may not uh, give you the help. Once this is over, then you have to examine the patient. To start, even though we don't expect this patient has no pain, the orbit tenderness, so you have to start from all that. But I am not going to that here because neither can I demonstrate to you. Know that, but more important, I am going to go for some tests which you should not. The examiner is going to expect from you mainly number one is the Adam's forward bending test, then whether the head is balanced or not. Is there a limb length inequality and neurology? The rotation, somebody may ask you, so I have put there. But I will not expect from you, I will not be asking, but somebody can ask. So the three, these are the three things they will expect you to know. So I am going to do that. The Adams forward bending test is the commonest test asked in that side. This is also the test we do for a screening for a school to a school going students for the uh, deformities. Now, this is the same patient which I put you in the first slide. The same thing that you see looks like a very minimal curve, scapular prominence. But the moment you do the Adam test, look at the rib hub, a significant um, rib hub, which uh, not so obvious in the standard position. So, if you then this particular test is used for many things. One for dia for early diagnosis. Then also for, you can see the uh, hump, you can measure the rib hump. Third thing, it's the deformity disappears. That is for a, not a structural deformity, a flexible deformity or a compensatory deformity. So the next question the examiner will see here, this girl as I told you, uh, this girl, Definite deformity, definite moment, you put her at a forward bending test, you can see a big uh, hump, something like a razor back deformity, and that was when they opened up this patient picture. So, this test is very useful for that. But the examiner can ask you, what are the other tests like Adam forward testing where you would test the flexibility of spine? The commonest thing we used to do with children, very small children, say four to five years old, hold with one hand under the chin, under the jaw, other hand back up, gently lift it up, gently. If you are able to lift it up, you will see the deformity, if it is flexible or if it is a completely disappear. So very useful in children whom you can do that. Other one is lateral bend. One more thing given in the book is can push the curve from the convex side and see how much you can touch. So these are the things, at least three of them you should be knowing, usually the common question asked. This is not necessary for you, I have put this only because, see this is a Bunner's scoliometer. Now what is the idea, 
when the hip is why is it more prominent there's a rotational element so one of the way to know this angle of rotation is to know that by measuring the hip and uh, it's a very inexpensive one and like this you have scoliometers which can measure as on the picture from the book but this is completely easy but you don't have to do have these things even by uh, eyeballing if you look at the top of the uh, rib hub and look at the plane level compared to the lower level there you can eyeball and have an idea but it's a one good day of documenting it using a simple scoliometer but that not on the exam point this is something which is done today earlier we were not expecting you to do that but now almost all the students are prepared for that so we ask ideally you should have a plumb line you don't have a plumb line you don't have to worry take your ridge stick tie your knee hammer to the one end take the other end keep it on c7 this is kept from the spinous process of c7 that is what is given in the book and that's what we do and normally that you see the picture it should be in alignment with the gluteal cleft so it should be somewhere here so and this particular here there is a uh, displacement of 3 uh, cm so that is the measure of compensation so this plumb line has to see where the head is centered or not to say to say in inspection you can clearly make out by eyeballing that will be enough you have to tell about this if you do it learn good for extra marks or if you don't do it nobody going to ask nobody going to punish you for that they'll ask you to tell you will be happy some students nowadays bring plumb um, line also particularly in fnb everybody has to bring and is not very difficult that will be much better than a yeah, machine thing so this only just to know you should not forget one thing whenever you have a spinal deformity do the general examination for ligamentous laxity i think all of you will know that it uh, all the tests are not going into that but this is not part of it but it is better that to always do that also because that can be one of the causes for a secondary scoliosis and last and probably most important you should not forget your knowledge you will be thinking how can anybody forget but that that the only place everybody can forget is in the exam in real life also you won't forget. so you won't have you have a short time 15 minutes you can't be doing everything you have to do the gait you have to do the motor and sensory you have to do the reflexes i look for asymmetric reflex which are nothing but a eh, normal uh, uh, abnormal reflex is normally not seen one simple example for you is a babinski things like that now i mean if you are running short of time i'll tell you some simple tricks but you can just you know test in a probably for anyone just ask the patient about sensation but if there is a neuropathic condition they may be involved you can just ask the patient to walk jump or walk on the heel walk on the toes at least they give you an idea but when you make him walk on the foot you look at the foot if there's a cavus deformity that usually indicates spinal disorders now you know you have a clue now exam there at least you are for hand grip for the dorsiflexion plantar flexion knee flexion knee extension do a fast check so neurology is important as i told you observe gait if there's a neurology gait will be abnormal hop with just a hop test actually is a test patient to see the fitness it is not for neurology but anyway you can ask him by example ask him to hop in one leg there are different methods of doing hop test but just ask him to start on one leg and hop if they can do that the power of that side is good these are all please these are all not recognized to one this is just to save the time he let go walk if it says they don't know any sh short way but when any of this is abnormal then go for it this is to save time for you in the exam so you have you cannot do this on the patient so you have to tell the examiner examiner you tell sir i want to do inspection palpation blah 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 so he won't let you do that he will you don't he doesn't have answer for that 
because he knows what you will really want to help you. So you ask, say, I want to know the neurology, I want to know that uh, I had a forward bending test, he will give you the answers for you. With those answers, findings are given by the examiner. Your life is easy. With the history you have taken, what will be your diagnosis? Time will not permit me to go into different, uh, uh, I already crossed the time, I think. So, you should just at least know, is a congenital one, is it a neuromuscular one, is it idiopathic one. That's all. These are simple things that you have to know. You, you actually, your exam will stop with this. Uh, if in an online scenario, the patient was there, the different exam. That the next question, if at all they go, how do you proceed? You will be surprised. Most of the time, you come to the management, okay, sir, I will do this, I will put plaster, etc. Because you will never, this is a common thing. And when they say, you don't want to have an X-ray, yes, sir, I want an X-ray. But that's not the way you will put it in a spinal deformity. You have to be very clear. The expected question, thing will be, expect, Sam, I will ask you to, expect you to say, X-ray of what? What view, AP view, PA view, any special views? Expect you to use the word scanogram from the top to the bottom. There are views like Ferguson views, Dagnara view. I don't think you need, but if you ask, you should know what they are. What you are important is that lateral bending films. That is commonly done. So if another cash question will come to that later, then they may ask you. I do usually they will not, they may ask, they're not going to ask you how to know the invertebra, etc. You are usually for unless you are done very well. Research staging, they, they usually expect you to know. These are the ones. And without going details of MRI, they may ask you what the indication for MRI. So these lateral bending films, I am not going to the curves and all. Lateral bending films are to see how much correction can be obtained. Commonly done, so you may know. When you do an MRI, that's very important. When you think of a spinal dysraphism, when you have neurological abnormality, or you are desired surgery and you don't know what is that everything is all right after that. In all congenital scoliosis, where there's a or when there's rapid progression or left thoracic curve, early onset scoliosis, these are indications for you your examination will stop before I ask you. With that, I will stop unless otherwise uh, I hope. I hope I can see Janki not looking happy. I think I have crossed the time limit. Yeah, Any questions on this before we go to the next? Question? Yeah, I think we can take some questions and discussions. Yes. So, any of you? I think first, uh, DNB, if uh, you have uh, any doubt, please ask. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, one thing what uh, people is getting confused between the list scoliosis and kaipur scoliosis so how to differentiate okay. that means okay what scoliosis the, and scoliosis <laughs> that one's yeah. one combination of kyphosis and scoliosis that one condition kyphosis okay. scoliosis no, and means, uh, yeah another one is list sir which so they're two different things so uh, yeah so that is okay. the focus I completely avoided one thing. Scoliosis is actually rotational deformity. We know that. So the main problem, so if you, the kyphotic part can be so bad, you can't assess the patient, you can't take AP view. You need a stagnara view to take that. I avoided going into that because that will confuse the students. But primarily, scoliotic, Scoliosis is not a lateral deviation. It's a rotational deformity that produces your uh, picture of lateral curvature and the gibbous. So, kyphoscoliosis, the word came because if you do a bending uh, picture and you see the rib hump, it looks like a kyphos. There is some amount of kyphosis also is there. But it is actually not a kyphosis. It appears like a kyphosis because of rotation. So in the, my opinion, that's a wrong terminology. Yeah, and in fact, if you really look at them very closely, some of them are actually lordoscoliosis. They are lordosis with, and because of the rotation, it appears like a kyphoscoliosis. So I think you have to be very careful about using that term. 
Yeah, there's a question from Avinash about gate. Yes. Uh, you want to know how to identify gate quickly and what should we look for and in which sequence? See, the, the gate will depend on, first of all, if the patient is having a, a primary, uh, say like a final dysmorphism and having some neurological problem according to that, according to the thing, but that is, I mean, for example, if patient is going to have a foot drop, you have a foot drop. Or is going to have a bit of business and lumbar gait. But leaving that aside, the gait is going to be abnormal because the patient, because of spinal deformity, when he walks the shelf, you will immediately be able to make out that one, the patient's, uh, the spinal, uh, the limb length, if you see what happens, because there is a pelvic tilt, there can be a secondary limb length abnormality. That also will be obvious. So this is one thing. Otherwise, per se, the, the gait on neurology, the gait is not affected per se by the curvature alone. Only in advanced one, because of the cross tilt, they will be affected. But the gait is important because important thing about the gait is that if there is an obvious neurology, you can make out or associated problems. Someone asked, should use the plumb line test in the inspection or palpation? By in plumb line test, actually, I put it under special test. Really speaking, that is something where it, it's a, you are measuring the amount of trunkal deviation. So I will rather put it under measurement because you have to record it as three centimeters, five centimeters like that. So I put it under that. Uh, so. I will put it under special test or measurement. I left out so many things like I didn't tell what is research site. That's a very, very simple, straightforward, which you can read in the book. It's something I'm sure all of you will know. But things like that are commonly asked. Yeah, I think that's important. And I think most of them should be aware of it. If they're not, they need to check it. One of the questions asked to me in my MS, I had a uh, one spine case. It's actually not spine case. It's a post polio paralysis. Patient also had a polio. The examiner asked, "What is the importance of research staging other than for scoliosis?" At that time, uh, my mind was not working, so I couldn't answer that. But the answer is for age determination. Yeah. I, I couldn't. Uh, Someone asked about internal gibbous. Yeah, I um, see the here one thing about uh, the scoliotic curves is uh, rib humps, deformities, rotations, but, uh, all of them are rotational deformities. The spinal canals can be compromised, but if the word gibbous itself doesn't apply there. They, it's not an internal gibber. It is the rotational anomaly, and there is uh, it doesn't affect the canal per se unless there is secondary changes. Uh -huh. So I think, sir, we can take another case. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, I just let me just stop. I have to stop sharing this, you know. Sure, sure. Switch it off. I have to stop sharing this. Then I have to go to the other one. Then I go to share the screen. But this is not my laptop. I mean, then one.
machine out. All right. Now, um, now. It's not yet open. You need to open it. Not open. Okay. So I have not shared at all. No, so your screen is there. I think what you need to do is to stop sharing, open uh, the presentation, and then share the screen. Okay. Open your presentation, minimize it, and then go to share screen. Okay. Is it coming now? Yeah, great. Now just make it full. Slide show. Yeah, great. Okay. All right. Perfect. Um, so now in the same format like last time, unfortunately, at least there was something to see in inspection there. there here it may not be that easy to see in inspection. I tried my best. Now, this was a lady with 36 years old. She came with low, low back pain since five years. That five years was long back. Now, the, the examination will go same. History is very, very important here. The same for the diagnosis, much more than the previous case. So you have the you have your first question is going to be very, very important. What more you would like to ask the patient to know what the problem is. Once you say that, we'll give you the history. Then with the picture, what you see on inspection, if you are not able to see much, there's no inspection appears normal, doesn't matter. What are the things that you are going to test during examination? What is your diagnosis? Why? How will you proceed? How will you manage? So we have this patient here, and that is the history gives what more. Now, here the main complaint is pain. This is not going to be anything in our examination is not going to give as information as what she can do. So what more will you like to ask? Think in your mind. The pathologist, think in your mind. Let's see what more you have to ask. Now, I'll give you one more step. Her pain was for five years, but it is much more severe now for students. Now there's variation of pain to both lower limbs. And she gives history of neurogenic clarification. So you should have already told me that five years has the pain progressing, radiation of pain, claudication, etc. Now let's say that. the first important thing is the age of onset. Second is the profession of the patient. What is she? It's very, very important. Profession can help both ways, whether she is able to do the profession or profession is the cause of the problem. The pain, the first important thing is the is the mode of onset, particularly the trauma, etc. Not relevant here. Then type of pain, again something which is very individualistic. The real thing starts from where the pain is continuous or intermittent. This is very very important because the one thing which you can easily differentiate. Let me say that this patient is suffering from a problem like a chronic infection, like tuberculosis. It's a continuous pain. It's a progressive pain. Let me say that her problem is due to an uh, inflammatory condition, a facetal problem, a facetal arthritis, let's say due to rheumatoid. It will be intermittent pain with exacerbation and remissions. So that is one. Continuous or intermittent is number one. Malignancy, it is a continuous pain. Trauma is not a continuous pain. Patient takes just the pain goes. Second thing, that is number one. Second thing, is it progressive? Very, very important. Because, as I told you, if it is going to be uh, infective one, chronic infection, it is going to be progressive. It may stop progression because of treatment. Unless treated, then, what do you mean by progressive? You mean the severity of pain. A patient who is not able to say about uh, how progressive or she says, I don't know, then you have to tell. But the beginning, in the beginning with the pain, could you work? Are you doing the same thing now? Before you were able to do your household duties, are you doing it now? You're going to the school or office walking, are you able to do it now? 
are you going to get the sleep are you getting sleep like that you have to know and are you doing are you able to do whatever you need to do uh, other than that next is the remission exacerbation radiation of pain this is very very important you will all be surprised how often a yeah, pain which is referred from the spine to the hip has been missed the spinal problem is hip missed and the hip problem is operated this is not unusual it happened to a lady of mine is a very common one referred pain relieving factors aggravating factors diurnal variation diurnal variation means everybody thinks only of night crisis no that's not the only thing tuberculosis is not the only one by diurnal variation even in ankylosing pondylitis pain is more in the night pain may be more in the morning it may be early morning stiffness can be taken as pain so all these things are not part of this one but this is common for any condition in uh, any joint problem neurogenic claudication is specific moment you say neurogenic claudification examiner last how do you differentiate between neurogenic and vascular claudication you should know that it's not a difficult one we will all know that i am not going to go into that treatment taken and most important thing what is the patient's disability our idea of treatment the patient has no problem then why do we do anything at all as far as helping the patient we have to know what are the disabilities that the patient is able to walk is there a simple like the grading of ambulation also most important thing is that daily living arrangement is it handicap by so this is what you have to ask a patient with this kind of deformity which is a, a instability this particular problem deformity is instability here here the important thing is about the pain so what is the going i want to go and ask you that you should know that in a patient with instability the most common symptom is lower back pain and you should ask for leg pain pain in gluteal region weakness bladder bowel problem and whether the patient is both gait is altered her body projection is altered there are all the various kind of symptoms but you must remember that sometimes they can be totally asymptomatic also and so the degree of a pain that i am going to have is not relevant to the degree of slip or degree of instability it can vary from person to person and particularly some of these patients they will come with a history of injury saying that i had the pain only after the injury pain before that they may not have noticed or they may not remember you should think that the root pains are not only when you get a this problem or you get a case of a disc herniation in your exam no you can have a root problem even in a instability particularly i'm talking about a list so even there can be because of narrowing of canal or due to irritation due to other causes will come later so your history along with pain all these things have to be asked now why is it so important i'm Please. like a power cut or something a minute just a minute yeah sure okay. i've just put the hot spot on the one problem in pondicherry is very very the thing is frequent power cuts for us ah amma can you get oh it just come no no it happens in patna also sorry it, it didn't come it's the inverter i buy i want the other mobile of mine अंगेर का पर we we can see you is your laptop on off no that should yeah laptop will not be a problem uh, we can see, we can see and hear you so just yeah so you can hear me yeah yeah oh fantastic i don't know how <laughs> anyway so that's nice uh, i have put on uh, they are able to see me and hear me i don't yeah, know and just put on the full screen it'll be fine fine and i just try to do that i remove the full screen to go into the sorry one second yeah okay 
Okay. All right. So why this is very, very, um, sorry, I lost the thing. So we were talking about some patients can have a neurotradition or spinal canal. Now, this history is very, very important because if you have a instability, you have to know the cause. That could be because of degenerative problem, it could be traumatic problem, and history will completely be different with the same problem. That is the one of the things. Example, age. You don't get a degenerative instability, say, be, below the age of 40. You can't get very unusual. You can't get. It will be most likely other causes like ischemic congenital dysplastic, etc. So, age is important. Then the level, that is going to be important. And how you, uh, I was coming to that. The reason for uh, coming to that was because how do you get the root pains in an instability? There are many problems. For example, if it is a ischemic type, there is a defect in the pars interarticularis. There is a fibrocartilage defect there. That may press upon the root. Or patient can get an indivertible disc herniation like any other person. Or like it be a pseudo disc. Or there could be a facet arthritis secondary with osteophytes, which can also irritate the wrist. All this can produce or like a hypertrophy, all this can produce root pains. So you should not only ask about neurogenic claudication, should also ask suggestive of a radiculopathy also. So uh, that is all the importance of history. Now let's come. This, uh, you, uh, as you can see, this is not a perfect back view like we had for the patient with the scoliosis, but this oblique view because I can see the patient's hand there. I have put that because if you can see this only in this view, that you can see that that is the spinal process, spinal coming up. So here, if I run my finger, if I run my finger, imagine you can see that. So here that comes the area where suddenly this area goes into a convexity. So what you will see a step like this, you don't have to palpate in a high grade slip. In a high grade slip, you can see this. So, is that one of the step sign when you palpate? That will be one of the important things. Is that the only thing you see in inspection? No. This is the one of the things which you are going to confirm by palpation. Why I put this? Only to tell that in a low grade instability or a low grade listosis, you may not find anything in inspection. So, it is only when you do the examination by palpation and the other but the other things along with it looking for so many things you are going to know so inspection only in a high grade slip you can make out but what all will you see and come the letter but if you have a patient seeing from the side like this again where the instability is more or in a high grade slip you can see a hyperlordosis you can see that pain is entirely lordotic hyperlordosis the body has gone to the front. So the one of the things that you can see. So what the examiner will ask you, if you have a patient, now only the current came. I don't know how you have this thing. What you will see, what the examiner will ask you is, what you see in inspection. Your patient may not have anything in inspection. So you have to answer what you will see. We'll come to that. So what I expect the patient to say, what I can see in inspection, one is an exaggerated lumbar lordosis, lumbar or thoracic lumbar, depending on which area is involved, and a hyperkyphosis or an increased kyphosis below them because the center of gravity shifts to compensate for the slip. The third, your trunk may appear shortened when it has gone to the high grade and even gone to the spondylolisthesis or a grade 5 where it has completely gone, it has completely toppled over. And the difficulty in gait, inspection includes that, make the patient walk, the difficulty in gait will come, what the difficulty will come. So, for example, I ask you what are these you can see in inspection, exaggerated lordosis, lumbosacral area, there will be kyphosis below, trunk appears short, and gait may be altered. Now the examiner will ask you, okay, you examine. What all will you examine for? The first and foremost, of course, tenderness. You have seen a step or you have not seen a step. Tenderness, it may not be that tender like an infection. It 
see a deep tenderness unless you are going to press hard there may not be pain in the initial stages at least so a deep palpation may produce pain and tenderness uh, will give you tenderness a step is usually palpable particularly in a slip more than grade two spinal movements will be limited why will come later hamstring tightness is one of the important findings in the slip how do you know that you ask the patient to stand you ask her to keep the knee extended and touch uh, bend forward she will not be able to flex the hips the last four findings are already what we saw in inspection hyperlordosis trunk shortening kyphosis below the level and gait difficulty so these are the four things that you have examined look for tenderness look for the step look for the spinal flexion look for hamstring tightness how do we do that now if you see this we need a second again now to see this patient the cord lordosis again from the book the lordosis is very very clear here and this a uh, transverse loin increase and here you can see there is no baseline you can't make out you can't make out any baseline but you can see a transverse loin increase so these are the things clearly seen in the inspection now second thing is scoliosis when do you get a scoliosis in a extremity that it one if there is by any reason a root irritation if there is a root pressure like you have a scoliosis in a acute intervertebral disc prolapse similarly you can get this there is something bad the slip may not be symmetrical just not andro posterior if there is a asymmetrical pelvis that also will put scoliosis and when there is a what is called a a dystrophic crisis where there is a total canal occlusion there is a severe nerve root retention and patient comes with the hand supporting the knees and patient may have a uh, there also patient can have a scoliotic curve and other finding that you will see will be the shortening of the lumbar spine when the if there is a grade 5 this goes the trick the the l5 goes over l1 sorry s1 so this is where you see ask the patient to bend forward you can clearly see that patient is not able to bend completely so that you can this much so that is because of the hamstring tightness you are made the thing straight so you are not able to spend as i told you tenderness then hamstring tightness and uh, this hamstring tightness plus also the paraspinal spasm and try look for the neurology if there is a problem couple of things the examiners can ask you in analysis is yes, if you do very well one is the fallen dixon sign and a stock test these are not very difficult fallen dixon sign is ask the patient to bend the knee i'll put the next slide so that's what you have to do the patient what uh, patient stands in the high grade slip the patient stands with a flexed knee like this you can see the hyperlordosis very clearly patient has atrophic pain and the sacrum is vertical and the tight hamstrings and when the patient walks these patients walk with a badling gait so this is a, what is called a the fallen dixon sign which is seen in a sciatic crisis which occurs in a sciatic crisis or listed the crisis which occurs in a high grade spondylolisthesis the same thing a diagrammatic way what happens here that is the sacrum s1 l5 completely toppled over so the the spine is almost straight and it's almost transverse here so sacrum becomes almost vertical and that gives the hamstring spasm and this classical gait so that is one second is the ask the patient to stand on one leg both the first one right leg then the left leg ask the patient to look up or hyper extend the leg extend the lumbar spine this is not diagnostic of distresses or something this is only showing that the increased pressure on the side produces pain this is also useful looking for lysis and many other conditions but when there is a significant uh, instability and patients 
made faults on the lytic area or the defect, it is painful. So this is called the stop test. There's something the examiner usually ask. Um, it is um, also called one uh, leg stance. And you can, if there's a defect on both sides, it will be a positive on both the sides. This particular patient had a loss of varangal jerk and alpha S1 weakness. So that in a real scenario, you should not miss the angle jerk. Because quite often, unless you practice it, you will forget to do that. You may find the weakness if you test, but angle jerk, you may miss it, you should not miss it. So I already told this. So it comes to diagnosis. So diagnosis, what we expect is not just to say spondylolisthesis. You should know what is the commonest. Commonest is ischemic. The patient is going to be somewhere from 20 to 40, most likely age that is going to be that. And this plastic comes an earlier one. Degenerative usually comes after 40s and 50s. So you should be able to say whether it is uh, most likely, you can say to the which level, according to you can uh, know the level by uh, uh, drawing the top of the idea crest that goes between L4 and L5. So you know where the mistress is. So you have to say whether it is a smith type, what do you think, or a degenerate type. This is the main thing. Um, the this plastic you can't say clinical. The last thing will be what do you do? Again, there are many views, so you have to say just not x-ray, you have to say the views also. Here, instead of your lateral bending films. Dynamic x-rays, you have to tell may increase on flexion. That means it's a, it is it is going to be more on flexion. So this will be seen by that. So your grading will be in flexion, not the one in lying down. Sometimes lying down, it may become less. So particularly this patient, I'm putting the picture, the very old film, so it is going to be not a very good quality like today. Here, the patient had a double level listing. So one is the L4, L5 and the L5, S1. So this particular film is seen only if the patient is in as much bending as possible. AP view, Napoleon head side, I'm not going to that. What are the views you need? Here also is a Ferguson coronal view. Flexion extension films or lateral or forward bending films or dynamic X-ray, these are very important. Why this is important? There is a record that even a standing film shows an increase compared to lying down film. So that is why a dynamic x-rays are very important. You can see this particular one, the patient taken in different position. You can see the mark here. You can see the edge here. The distance is much more than here than in the bending film, the compared to the extension film. You can see that defect here, uh, the pass intraarticularis defect. And that lysis, it has gone to dysplasis. The last thing, usually they are not, now the radiologically, there are so many parameters. The Meredith classification is the oldest classification. Today, there are even modified Meredith is there. I'm not going to any of those things, but Meredith is should not. That is uh, uh, something which has tested, stood the test of time. I think it is somewhere in 1940s. I don't often remember that. So, sorry. So, Meredith is very simple. The S1 is divided into four zones, depending on how much, sorry, S1 divided into four zones, how much the, the L5 vertebral body moves forward. I think all of you will know that. And the last thing is MRI, what is the indication? What is the advantage? These are all you have to know. And that's the MRI of the same patient where you can show both the L4 and L5. You can have a this bulge like that, or this is pseudo disc. Actually, it is not bulge because of this displacement. You can see a pseudo disc here. This is a thing. So this can produce both can produce that. The MRI confirmed for this patient. The treatment. When you say in the exam, please don't jump to surgery. Always consider first non-operative treatment. And depending on your case, you can justify. Don't have to get all the cases. In fact, if you take the most of the series, hardly 20% of these patients need surgery. You don't need so much. 
so I'm not going to go into this. So different surgeries you don't need, and I am sure that you will know more than that. I am not going to. That. Thank you. Already crossed five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you so much. John, okay, John, yeah, let yeah, me. Yeah, I have one go thing ahead. I want to leave, John. Uh, yeah. I don't have much experience in the online bit. So it's, it is post COVID era. So that's why I have a little bit. If it is a cubital viral, I can manage it. No, no, no it's it's okay. No, no, it's great. Actually, it was good. Uh, I mean, there were some technical problems which you can't avoid sometimes. They keep happening to everybody. So don't worry about that. Uh, great. So I think uh, the important mm -hmm. points were certainly brought out and if there are any questions, we'll take them. Yes, sir. One question Dr. Sumit has asked about the crank sub phenomena. Okay, I'm not able to hear. Crank, crank sharp sharp phenomena, sir. Phenomenon. Phenomenon I heard. First part I didn't hear. Crank sub crank. phenomena, sir. Uh, I... I am not able to understand. The crank shaft. Oh, crank shaft phenomenon. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Crank shaft phenomenon with relation to distresses, I really do not know. We talk about a crank shaft phenomenon usually when we do a scoliosis correction and not relation to distresses. Uh, it is like this when you correct, um, um, we are going back to scoliosis correction. I, I put it in relevance to distresses, I don't know. When you correct it, deformity, for example, if you are going to do a thoracolumbar scoliosis and you gave, I put a long correction, particularly in the golden days when we have the rigid fixation, and you make the thoracolumbar junction as straight, it is going to produce the correction. Yeah, that's what simple way of telling. Um, I think it's typical in uh, spinal, I don't know. spinal in scoliosis itself when you fuse posteriorly and then the anterior part still grows and then you end up with a more severe uh, rotational deformity. So that's what they talk about in the crankshaft phenomenon. So that is side is fixed yeah. while the other isn't, so you end up with more problems. Yeah. Oh, okay. No relation to distresses. It's more to do with uh, uh, scoliosis. So, yeah. But I guess yeah. would uh, because there's no growth left usually in spondylolisthesis except yeah in yeah here growth usually will go over there. So uh, and one more uh, thing which is uh, the uh, examinee confused about how to say the diagnosis in exam because the in case of listesis and all it is not only listesis but some uh, spondylosis. Is also okay. there. So, how to say how to the say diagnosis? That. How to include? I mean, spondylolysis, not spondylosis. How to say the type? Okay. See, in examination, very unlikely will give you a lysis. There may be a different grades. Now, but in in a clinical setting, forget about it. You should know. See, a patient coming with a spondylolysis. She will have pain, you will not have any step sign no there, findings. your spinal movements will be almost normal. In fact, you will have more findings and more findings in the history, sorry, more points in the history than clinical examination. But you do a stock test, it will be pain. That is where you put the point on. So if a patient coming with a recurrent pain, you don't find anything, you should look for that. Number one. Number two, more important is. A complete diagnosis. See, if you get a step sign, no problem. If you don't get a step sign, a tenderness and a hamstring spasm, you don't find any other diagnosis, you can think of it. But more important, what is the cause of the distress? For example, it may be post surgical. He might have had a surgery and then kept the case. So, I have said that patient had a surgery for a back problem. Now he has come. Or a trauma that can cause. Our patient is 60 years old, you can think of a degenerative one. But if the patient is a high high sportsman or a gymnast, athlete coming 70 to 20 with a positive step, you will think in terms of a uh, type of listosis. Yeah, I think uh, you need to look at uh, the history and clinical findings as well as the x rays to come to a diagnosis about that. And they basically, you'll either get a isthmic or you might get a 
dysplastic type of uh, spondylolisthesis. And of course, the degenerative ones are not big steps. They will be uh, much, uh, the problem is related to other things like spinal stenosis, etc., which are the cause of the symptoms. So uh, usually in the degenerative listhesis, you will not get a huge step. You will get it in the isthmic or the dysplastic type. Another important thing is, you don't see a degenerative listhesis in L5S1. Yeah, usually L4, L5. Yeah, it's L5 not L5. common. Uh, isthmic will be L4, L5 commonly or L3, L4. Degenerative is... It's not that degenerative is not common. Most of the time, they don't come to hospital. That's the one of the reason. But it, it is huge. I have seen L5S1 a few cases, but very, very unusual. In the yeah. exam, if you get L5S1, don't think of degenerative. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Or? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Rajagopal. Um, it's a pleasure always to catch up and uh, hopefully we'll meet up in Pondicherry sometime yes. in the future. <laughs> whenever, I, whenever I go to alumni, they ask only one person. Why John is not coming? Why John is not coming? <laughs> well, I, I, I usually don't get to hear of it till quite late. So, let's <laughs> hope so next time it's possible. And then my schedules are already sort of. I know, I know how busy you are. I always say one person no, no, no. stress fracture means it should be for John only because I don't see anybody taking more stress physical than this. Sir. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. And thanks, John. I should say thanks to John. No, no, no. Thanks to you for. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank bye. You. Thanks to all of you yeah. who have been listening. Thank you. All. Thank you, sir. Okay, bye. Can I stop sharing? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you.